So then I was like, screw it, Grandma. I'm going to become a street artist, yo. I mean, most people see a wall, and they just see a wall. I look at a wall, and I see, like, a goat in a backpack. Right. Like a ninja handing out cheeseburgers. Whoa. A chill alien, you know? Well, who doesn't see a chill alien? That's my question. A lot of people. A lot of people. It's sad. TVTL. Anytime you can do something that's fun, you like to do it and make money doing it, hey. It's a win, win, win. And anytime you can win, 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 you're win, win, winning, you know? If you're just winning or win, winning, that's that's just winning or win, winning. But when you're win, win, winning, you're win, win, winning. Doors go up, doors go down. That's what garage doors do. I feel like we're just like in that tired mode where you're delirious and you're laughing at silly things. Uh-oh. He's starting that funny talk again. Well, all right, hello, good morning, and welcome, everyone, to a Monday edition of TBTL, the show that just might be too beautiful to live. Oh, and the adventure begins again. My name is Luke Burbank. I am your host. As, as Jay would say, uh, he's got flow. Coming to you from the Madrona Hill studio, perched high above the mighty Columbia, where we are still enjoying some truly lovely weather. I feel warm, and, and I'm levitating. And uh, I've got this thing pretty much... Uh, pretty much dialed in because as the weather is starting to change a bit around here, I will be heading down to Los Angeles this week and then later Palm Springs where I will oh, be. Oh, Ma, Pa, it's just beautiful. Just looking at like five to six straight days of warmth and sunshine and happiness and high fives and good feelings, which is a lot of the things that will also be happening here on episode 4,164 in a collector series. Let the fun begin. It's a Monday Wall Street, the NASDAQ, business things are happening again, and we've got some business news Well, I for guess you. I just have my first taste of the filthy side of this business. Joanne Fabric, she has declared bankruptcy. And also, uh, Dollar General has admitted that they, uh, <laughs> they, they overemphasize the self-checkout uh, kind of element of their business model. And it's for a reason that even before I heard the reporter on NPR this morning explain why they decided they're going to actually sort of scale back their self-checkout uh, endeavors, I knew exactly why they were going to do it. So we'll talk about that today. Uh, and uh, we'll probably also end up talking about the fact that I had to sort of let the big dog out this weekend during a radio recording session. I'll say, I'll say what's up, dog? Doesn't happen that often. And then Andrew also had an interesting weekend. Uh, he was playing a lot of bingo at the uh, Eagles in Seattle over the weekend. You play to win the game. And something happened there as well. Speaking of my good friend Andrew Walsh, the longest running Cobra of the show, maybe best known for his depictions of the tall ship. Oh, hey, y'all said my name. Joining me right now. Good morning, my friend. Luke, I don't consider myself a victim, and I don't want to complain about things, but there are small things in life that other people don't have to deal with that I do have to deal with. Like when I text you on a Sunday night and I tell you I have a bingo story, I have to make it very clear. <laughs> I'm talking about bingo the game and not bingo the cat. Other You're people a don't... victim of you're actually a victim of having too much good stuff happening in your life. <laughs> too you have an adorable cat named Bingo, and you have access to one of the hottest bingo games in Seattle. That's at right, the Mother Airy Numero Uno, hey, hey. which I am also technically a member of. It's an underground bingo game, Luke. You're not supposed to say where it, where it happens. There must be underground bingo games, right? Like underground card I bet. rooms, like somewhere. I, I, um, that's a good question. That's I would say that the. The, the question around uh, illegal bingo is sort of related to the question around illegal cannabis. When something is readily available above ground everywhere, does it do something to eliminate the kind of underground sure. yeah. um, marketplace? Like, certainly, I put it this way. When bingo is outlawed, only outlaws will play bingo. Mm -hmm. But for now, you can sort of head to any senior center, any fraternal order, um, a number of casinos, just like there's a lot of places that you can play bingo legally. I wonder what the interest in the underground version would be. Do you know that my cat bingo, his personal slogan is when they mm -hmm. outlaw bingo, 
only outlaws <laughs> will play with bingo. I don't know if you yes. knew that. Again, just to add more complexity to this bingo It's on situation. his LinkedIn page. <laughs> I, I believe so. It's also on his back tattoo. Yeah. Um, which, honestly, as a pet owner, I feel somewhat irresponsible letting him get that. I had to sign off yeah. on it, but, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, we it's not an exact science, cat parenting. No, I mean, yeah. you sort of learn as you go along, you know. He's our third cat, so. The thing about the, thing about, uh, the illegal card games is that usually, in my experience, and this is something I know a little bit about, like the the not let's just say the not technically legal poker games that i used to play in much more when i lived in portland the reason they popped up was because all of the legal poker games had closed for the night uh-huh right so you don't the 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 game that should not be happening according to the vice the bunko squad of the portland pd by the way one of the first squads they eliminated when <laughs> When the Portland PD ran out of funding was the Bunko Squad. I don't think I've ever heard that phrase before, but it sounds fun. The Bunko Squad in the, like, 50s, in the kind of the Frank Drebin era, the Dragnet era of policing, I, I always associate it with the guys that would bust up the flim flams and the, okay. the, the illegal casinos, the, the <laughs> stuff the, that you should have... All, all the words were very frivolous, though. The Bunko Squad busted yeah. up the flim flams. Okay, yeah. now the, I got you. <laughs> the Bunko... Would would uh would would bust the flim flams. It wasn't. It was like Bunko was never. It was it was never like you're not solving a murder. Right. You're you're kind of like you know you're again you're busting illegal gambling operations and the like. But vice kind of like a vice. Squad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Vice, but 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 more whimsical. But more whimsical. <laughs> exactly. The Gonzo but, Squad was also exactly. a lot of fun. <laughs> so. The uh, but like the game that I used to play in more often than was good for my soul or my bank account was it would start at well it would actually start at about midnight but when it would really get going would be about two a.m. when everything else that was legal would close and then people would sort of start to kind of drift drift on in as it were to the game throughout the night and sometimes that game could go for a couple of days straight. And, yes. and, and, and again, the value, the value of it, and I put that in air quotes for people not watching this on Instagram, the value of that was just that you could be playing poker at three in the morning and you couldn't do that anywhere else. But mm -hmm. during the, the regular hours when all the other places uh, were open, it was less, it was kind of less um, uh, appealing to folks. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you're all taking healthy breaks to have a bowl of soup here and there, keep your... Yeah, you know, supply. just yeah, exactly. Staying hydrated, Staying a, hydrated. I'm sure. A couple people making sure everyone's very well hydrated with uh, whiskey. Uh, right, exactly. Well, here's my here's my little bingo story that I wanted to tell you. Um, I think I should uh, predicate this by saying, when I play bingo at the Eagles, which actually I haven't in a while. It's like the first time I've played in a few months. Um, I don't. I, I truly mean this. I don't really even think about winning that much. Mm -hmm. I guess I wouldn't yeah. say I don't care about winning, but like I'm just there to hang out with the gang. You know what I mean? And just sort of like make small talk during bingo. Like that's it's that's also kind of hard to win. There's a lot of people there. You have like a, a lot of one, people. A one in one hundred chance on a given game, probably, right? And yeah, and I don't wanna I don't want to exaggerate this part, but also I don't love winning um, yeah, at bingo. I mean, because right. you got to get up, you got to yell bingo. I don't like, I don't yeah. like yelling things. I could never be a barista for a lot of reasons, but the hardest part I think wouldn't be making the foam leaves on, on the coffee drinks, but instead the yelling somebody's name, Luke, yeah. your order's ready. Like I just like I don't I yelling bingo. Well, there's isn't also my the dynamic thing. in bingo that's it's it's one of the few group gambling activities where everyone hates you when you win everybody because well it is, kind of fake hates you i guess they all throw their well I, it was up. real when i was there well i really hate hated the all. people that oh. won no 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 <laughs> Come on. They didn't hate you over bingo, Luke. Somebody's mom kept winning when I was there. Yeah, Elm, was like, Elmer's the, mom. I think she's 86, man. She I was, was like, winning too much. The game is much. rigged. You've yes. had your run, Elmer's mom. Yeah, that wasn't the only um, time either. But like, um, but but it is, I, I mean, it to me, it's like you say this, Andrew. It's kidding on the square, I think. Like, maybe for me, it was depending on how many uh, alcohol drinks I'd consumed that night. But yes, there is the kind of thing where you ball up your... Your car, your your you know little piece of paper that you were playing on, you throw it at them. Everyone kind of goes rah. But I do think for some of us, and maybe this is where I'm more of a compulsive gambler than you are. If 
five percent of that was real. Five percent of that was like, gosh darn it, like I didn't yeah. win. Yeah, you know. So it, there's a weird element to winning at the game that you're talking about because you have to yell, it, and also that you're you're coming in for a certain amount of group scorn. Well, if that is if there if there is a bit of truth to that paper throwing and groaning, well, then that really kind of plays into the story a little bit because, so. Genevieve and me and our crew of people and Nita and Kevin and Katie and everybody, we're all like kind of we, we're sitting kind of in our normal place in the bingo hall. And um, Genevieve basically is the first person to win, uh, yell bingo for the first two games. Oh, so wow. when you win just a normal game, I think Real it's like Elmer's a, mother. Situation. Yes, it's like a forty dollar payout, I think. But Genevieve yells bingo for both the first and second game. But then somebody else yells bingo after her. So she splits that pot. But right away. All of the scorn is directed towards our corner of the room, right? Because uh -huh. we, we have kind of a, a winner twice in a row, although she had to split the pot both of those times. And then I think we let somebody else win the next time. And then uh, let them win. <laughs> and then I can't remember what happened next. I think I won the next one and uh -huh. I didn't have to split it with anybody. Again, this was just like a normal bingo card. So it was a payout of 40 bucks. So Genevieve has now won like $20 twice. I've won 40. We've basically paid you're, for our main tickets. Yeah, at this your point. household is up $80 on this we're, whole we're situation? We're not even quite broken even because I think now this is where things get a little bit complicated. You can buy you buy the regular bingo sheets, which I think are, mm -hmm. is a book of six of them for the regular games, and those are like 20 bucks a pop. So, But then you can buy these special little games, you know, extra squares um, for special games that they roll out during it. And so I think all told, Genevieve and I probably individually paid in $40, right? And now so far uh -huh. between the two of us as a com uh, as a couple have uh gotten $40 back. So that's only still in like half of our uh of our not our nut, but half of our um investment, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, um that's all fine and good, but then I oh and then Kevin wins one too. So Kevin's sitting to my wow. left, Genevieve's to my right, he wins one. So maybe there's some scorn in the in room. The I'm not sure exactly. Um and that's the regular and that's the regular game. I was fine with my winning. They threw paper at me. I yelled bingo, I did the whole thing and I and I got forty dollars. Um, but then the last game of the night, and I know you know this, Luke, but um, I, I, I kind of want to carefully explain it here for people who are unfamiliar. Blackout. But yeah, it's the blackout round. So you can buy as many of these little individual squares um, on top of, you know, the regular game as you want. And instead of just having to get a line across or a line di diagonally like most bingo games, it's called blackout. You have to get Every, they'll call out the numbers and you have to black out every single one on your bingo card. That's pretty self-explanatory, but it's also a progressive pot, which means mm -hmm. each week they play this game and there's a certain amount of money in the pot. Let's just say let's just say it's like four hundred dollars the, the first week. Right. And yeah. they're going to call out maybe fifty five bingo numbers. And if anybody gets blackout in that first 55 calls, then you win the entire pot. Let's say it's 400 bucks. Yeah. If they get I deeply misread how that game worked, by the way, when I played it with you all that night. I thought I was supposed to get blackout drunk. Oh, no. you Well, you are supposed to, as I did oh, okay. this, this Saturday oh. as well, by the way. It's called a double blackout. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but, so I was so playing congratulations. It Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a side game. So anyway, um, if nobody gets the blackout bingo in, let's say, the first 55 calls, the game will continue, but the winner will no longer get the big pot. They'll just get like I a see. payout of 150 bucks, right? Okay, And gotcha, then the gotcha. next week, that $400 is carried over. Over, and so for that blackout, now the kitty is up to $800, right? Mm -hmm. And now they're going to extend it, though. On this night, they're going to read 60 numbers. And then if nobody uh -huh. gets it in the 60, then it rolls over and it rolls over. You get a little bit of a payout, and I think you get 150 bucks, right? Um, yeah. Tonight, and again, when I play the blackout especially, like it seems like a pretty tall order. And so I I was going to buy two of the blackout tickets. Genevieve told me to buy four of them. I do what I'm told. I, I bought four of these <laughs> things. She she literally said when the woman came over to sell the extra tickets, Genevieve's like, I got mine. So you just buy whatever you want. I'm like, OK, I'll take two. She says he wants four. I'm like, OK, I want <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt I've never felt closer to Genevieve than in this story. It literally went down like that. So anyway, she literally said, you have autonomy. Do whatever you want. And I said what I wanted. She's like, he doesn't want that. He wants something else. So anyway, so I got four. Did of you these say things. to her, I'm curious what would make you feel feel comfortable saying that to me? 
I did respond to our uh, an email from my friend Phyllis Fletcher with that line uh, yesterday. <laughs> she was asking about some appliances we have, and I wrote back, I'm surprised you feel comfortable asking me about that. <laughs> anyway, um, call back to Friday's show. So all of this is to say, when I sit down to play Blackout, I definitely am not thinking about winning. You know what I mean? It just seems like a pretty yeah. tall order to do that. And There's we a reason down, that it pays so much. It's exactly. Hard to, it's really hard to do. And uh, Saturday's pot was up to two grand. It was up Holy to one thousand one thousand nine hundred and eighty nine dollars or something like that's, that. Right? That's hand pay territory. If you're at the casino, you have to sign tax documents. If I you think win you do. Yes, a pot that big. That's that gets on the radar of the state of Washington. It, I speak from experience. Exactly. And I even remember thinking like, oh God, if you win this, then you got to deal with. Like I don't even know where to begin tipping <laughs> on that, and like mm -hmm. I, that's you know me well enough to know that one of my uh, least popular traits is me start starting to worry about things that should otherwise be good news. Um, but I uh, I also am thinking like, you know, like uh, what are the tax situation? Like I'm not going to win this. It doesn't even matter. But when I hear how much money it is, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money. And so we start playing the game, and we're I don't know how many numbers they're going to call on this night. I feel like it was up there. Like let's I'm just going to say like it was like 65 or 70 numbers they're mm -hmm. going to call out. And if anybody gets a blackout in that time frame, then you get the the full kitty. If not, you get 150 bucks. Um, and so we're all just talking. We're playing the blackout. It's a long game, obviously, because it takes a long time for people to get blackout. And all of a sudden, I notice. And I'm you were sort of like saying out loud to our friends, like, oh, I only got five more to go until I get a blackout. And people are like, five more? That's pretty good. I'm like, yeah. And then Jen, the bingo caller, calls the next two numbers are my are, are mine. I'm down oh, to like wow. three. I'm down Holy to friggin' smokes. three away from winning the two thousand dollar blackout. And then um I gotta say at this point. I think for the first time ever, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, what will it look like if I win? And my heart is actually, I can feel my heart mm -hmm. racing a little bit. Yeah. That that might have to do with my diet, but I think it had to do with the adrenaline in the moment as well. And I'm like, damn. And then she calls a num another number. I'm down to two. And people are like, oh, my God, Andrew, you're down to two. And then she says, all right, we're at number whatever. Yeah. I'm going to call three more numbers, I believe. Or maybe it was, I'm going to call two more numbers. You all have two more chances. She calls one of the numbers, and I'm down to one. And I, I might have the timeline on this wrong a little bit, but I am down to all I need is, I believe, a I want to say a B21 or an I21. I can't remember which mm. column it's in. All I need is a 21 for her to say 21 and I'll have won this pot. But now I, I think I'm down to two more calls. She needs to call 21. She calls the next number. It's not 21. We're down to the very last call for the big kitty. It's not 21. <gasps> Nobody wins the big pot. Okay. What do you think the next number called was? Oh my gosh, 21. 21. I was what if she Can had just said Can you do said, something for a 21? <laughs> that's a Drake I don't know reference. That's I try so. to keep the try to keep the stuff really really relevant here. So um, I won 150 bucks, but I mean oh, I, wow. I mean it was literally the one after if she had if things wow. had just shifted a tiny tiny bit. I don't know how things shift. It's bingo. It's literally ping pong balls coming out of an air fryer or whatever that thing is. <laughs> <laughs> air popper. Um but like I just couldn't believe that and so then I have to go up there anyway and still absorb the scorn of the room because and we're if I'm, if, like I'm if I'm tracking this correctly, we're now at You've won a regular bingo. Vives has won a regular bingo. Camaro Kev has won a regular bingo. Now you win the e diminished but still kind of insane blackout. Yeah. And actually, Your Genevieve is... won two, although she had oh, to split oh, the pot because she right. won the so, first so, one and the I second mean, this one. Is, yeah. Yeah. This is like your, your, your table, your corner has really dominated exactly uh, this, this round of bingo this night but i just couldn't believe how close i i mean I, I think i was a little shaky again i'm not somebody who gambles much and i and i also don't take it that seriously like i said like i didn't go into this being like oh we're gonna we're gonna pay off that human door we just installed in the garage or whatever like i didn't <laughs> I, <laughs> I wasn't like counting on it but then when you get that close to it and you're just staring at this number and then for it to be called the moment after like i don't think i've ever won 150 bucks before and felt like i lost you know what because I mean? Because of how close. I mean, Andrew, welcome to the very, very <laughs> beginnings of a 
of a, a, a complicated relationship with gambling. Yeah. Because that, th I mean, that's the thing about uh, about gambling and in particular things like bingo or slot machines are a really big one where um, people become, well, first of all, are just wildly superstitious about things, but also I'm always shocked, you know, when I'm playing slot machine or near someone who's playing a slot machine, how much importance people put on the fact that like th three of the four things they needed came out. Uh huh. Because I'm always thinking, what this machine did was it just generated a non-win. And anything that happens, I mean, they're all computers now. And this is different than bingo, but but the same in a sense. These are being randomly generated numbers. And with the slot machine, it's a randomly generated thing. It's basically either this wins or this doesn't win. And if it is, if it's a win, it's a win for this amount. And then my my sense of it is it just populates the screen to then support whatever the decision has already been made in the randomizer within the mm -hmm. machine, right? So in other words, if you got like three dragons, but you needed four, you weren't close. Mm -hmm. You were just, that's just how it decided to show you a non-win on that particular spin. Unless but you're there, the Khaleesi, in which case that's still pretty good. Like yes, you can do exactly. a lot with three dragons. That's I one mean, thing I've learned. honestly, like the, the possibilities are nearly endless. <laughs> you got three dragons and one dragon egg. But like... <laughs> Don't pick that up if you're not the Khaleesi, though. <laughs> yes, it's very hard. Um, but, like, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, but it's the, the thing that it does to your mind about this close miss. Mm -hmm. And it's very much a, very much a principle. I mean, because they could also program these slot machines to when you miss, just you really miss, like nothing, you know what I mean? Like, it's like zero dragons. Mm -hmm. It could be zero dragons because the difference between zero dragons and, and, Three dragons in this this hypothetical game yeah. I'm constructing. Because truthfully, if you if you are playing Triple Fortune Dragon Unleashed, three dragons rules. <laughs> so really, I need to back this Obviously, analogy up and Luke, say it's we know two that. dragons. <laughs> sure, of course. Well, two dragons and a coin, or mm -hmm. three coins, or three dragons. Mm -hmm. I don't think three dragons is yeah. even a thing in that game. But man, if it is, you're farting through silk. <laughs> yes. The point is the near miss factor. Chain it mail. really does something into your. It does something to your brain to feel like, oh my gosh, that was. Oh, and 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 that's kind of for certain people. And I don't I don't think you I don't think you have this again. The thing I think your armor against a problem with gambling is your um, kind of feeling of low self worth. Mm, nice. That you don't think of yourself, generally speaking, as a person who is going to win the Powerball. So yeah. then you don't feel like engaging in it. Whereas somebody like me, with an overinflated sense of self, thinks. Why not me? In the words mm -hmm. of noted nano bubble spokesperson Russell Wilson, <laughs> why not us? Right. Why not me? So my mentality is, this could be my lucky day. And I think you and I'm just I'm repeating mm -hmm. what I've heard you say. You tend to think that's probably not going to be my day no, when exactly. it comes to this gambling, which yeah. puts you in the exact right headspace for gambling, which is why you have a, a good and healthy relationship with the operator. I mean, I really don't gamble. I mean, I don't even think, like, again, when it's bingo night, I just, I don't think like, oh, it's the night that I could potentially come home with right. money. I just think, oh, we'll right. go hang out with Liz and the gang or whatever and like, and catch up with folks. But like then, um, and then pull tabs is kind of similar. Like, I mm -hmm. guess there've been a couple of times if I'm just sitting at the bar bore and I kind of start chasing a little bit, but I mean, just a little, little yeah. tiny bit. Like, I just don't. I don't expect it. I don't care. It's more something mm -hmm. to do for a little bit because I'm I'm a little bit fidgety and it's about looking at the little cartoons on the pull tab. So now, yeah, now I, I don't have an issue with that. Earlier in this conversation, when I was talking about how when I was there for bingo, how like I was playing along with the like pretend being mad at people, the kayfabe, mm -hmm. but that you know five percent of me was a little disappointed that it wasn't me, particularly on a game where. Speaking of close misses, when it's a bingo game where you're like most, you know, you need one more number for like a standard bingo and you and right when you're like, OK, OK, OK. And then it's not your number and then or letter or whatever exactly it is. And then someone else gets it. There is for me a, a feeling internally of like disappointment, like, oh, mm -hmm. that wasn't me, you know. And so you said that that, that might come in um, into play in the story later. And my question is, when you got up to go get your blackout prize, did you sense people were legitimately kind of annoyed with you and the table for too much winning? 
It didn't occur to me until you and I started talking about it. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I think of that as all just sort of bluster. And that, like we mentioned, it Elmer, probably is for normal people. We I mentioned mean, really. like Elmer's mom. I mean, there was one time. So I, I forgot that Elmer's mom, who I don't believe is even an eagle, but was just there visiting. Hmm, I didn't know, remember that she was there running the table when you were there, too, because she was definitely there one time that you weren't there and she ran the table. And I remember maybe that was like maybe a little tiny bit of like, oh, come on. Elmer's mom is winning again. But it's also hilarious because it's Elmer's mom, you know, like, like yeah. it's, a guest at the Eagles is just like embarrassing us at our own game of bingo. So, like, I don't think I've ever felt any kind of real, true animosity with maybe that one exception. In fact, like, I don't remember ever feeling re- truly disappointed at bingo except for the moment I won one hundred and fifty dollars, which is so bananas. Right. And, I mean, snatching, and wrong, somehow but, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Yeah, and like, so all told, my winnings for the night, my winnings, not counting Genevieve's, were like one hundred and ninety dollars which Jeez. definitely covered you know that was 150 and 40 and that covered clearly you know like the um the the, the my buy-in and you know drinks and i bought some drinks for some folks or whatever like i came out ahead like i came out ahead it was fun um but i but i mm. it didn't occur to me until you started talking now that there might have been some people in the room who are really like jesus christ man that that, <laughs> that corner of the table uh, you know is kind of taking all of our money i don't know but maybe because i don't have those feelings myself it didn't occur to me that other people were maybe I'm, burning a little bit i i think that my guess is that most of the people there are um you know are just having fun and they're not having those kind of complicated and again i would say it was 10 percent for me when i was there it wasn't mm-hmm. like you know, it wasn't like my overriding experience was one of frustration, but it, but 10% of it was because uh-huh. I was like, it would, it would be fun, you know, for me to be getting the money from this game or the blackout. Because again, that even that night I was there, it's a pretty significant amount of money. Like that's, you know, that's a big, like a couple of grand boy, you know, that could get you out of a, out of yeah. a couple of jams. I know. And again, I'm like sitting there like holding my dauber being like, oh my God, my heart is racing right now. When I was down to five and then I watched that thing disappear to like three and then two in pretty short order, I was like, is this actually happening? And I tried to picture my life after the $2,000 and, you know, like I have a private jet now. Like I want to know things clicking in for what your bingo holler would have sounded like, because here's something that I've learned from spending too much time in casino settings is in my experience, when somebody wins a significant amount of money, they go quiet. I'm talking Mm -hmm. in the $50,000 range, Mm -hmm. one of those nutty things on a slot machine where it's like whatever that ludicrous amount that's being, you know, sort of displayed at the top, the progressive. Like when you, my rule of thumb is if you're in the casino and you hear someone yell really loud, it probably means they won 20 bucks. Uh The louder that somebody yells, usually the lower the amount is down to a, 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 a floor of about maybe 20 or 40 bucks. But when someone, when you really win a significant amount of money, like... You go, it's almost like so stunning. Like your brain is trying to kind of process. You Uh almost kind of get quiet. And I wonder what for you, as your heart was beating, if it would have been B21, if you would have been like, bingo. (laughs) Like like the world starts to fall away. Like, is this happening? Or if you would have been like, if you would have been adrenalized when you yelled bingo, I like, think I, I would have yelled. Would have done. I think I would have yelled loudly, and I bet you I okay. did yell pretty loudly, like loud when you got at the next, the next. Yeah, or because my adrenaline was already up, and I would say like loudly uh-huh. by my standards. And I was going to ask you too. Um, well, I'll, I'll follow up with a question about you and how y- you would handle winning. Um, but uh, I think that I yelled, and also like. If it's a big amount of money, if I, if I had hit this like, you know, one turn earlier and I'd actually won the big kitty, like I think I would have been like my yell is dependent upon it. Like you don't like one time. I, the only time I've been there where somebody won the progressive pot, which I don't know how much it was that time. It was pretty big. I think three or four people all had to split it. Because the game had just gone on for so long, yeah. and then yeah, and yeah. then they all got blackouts on the same turn, at least three, maybe even four, so that, you know, again, diminished it significantly, but they all probably went home with, like, you know, a few hundred bucks or something like that. But, um, yeah, so I uh, I think that if I, I would have felt the need or, like, my body would have just yelled bingo because, like, I'm claiming this. <laughs> I want right. to be the first but to before yell it, somebody you know? else. Yes, exactly. I'm claiming this. Um, but uh, let's just say it's not the big 
pot, Luke, and it's just a regular uh-huh. bingo, and you won forty dollars. I guess you did not. You did not win any of the games when I you don't were think the, I know, did. No. What do I you did think not. your thing? Would, because there are very. You know, I go up there and I kind of just slink up there as as quietly as possible, and I don't look at the crowd, and I just look at Jen, who will then give me the money. You know, she's the bingo caller. Um, but then there are other people who, and, and this was charming, not obnoxious. Like there was a person uh, who won kind of near us, and she went up there, and it was um, it was a St. Patrick's Day theme, so she was dressed like a leprechaun, I think. Um, and, but just kind of walked up there and like spread her arms out so that everybody could nail her with the with the uh, you know balled up pieces of paper, or whatever. Like yeah. some people are like really drinking the moment. What would your you would slam dunk? I would the ball. be sheepish. Would I would you be? slink. Yeah, I'm yeah, a slinker be- because it's. And actually, this we don't have to get too into it later, but like uh, the Livewire 20th anniversary show happened over the weekend on Saturday night as Uh well. And there was a whole segment where I got it. I was interviewed on stage Mm. by the former host of the show, Courtney Hameister. And I was it's it was it was remarkable to me how uncomfortable I mean, not in a terrible way, but just in a like there. I guess my takeaway was there is a certain kind of attention that I desperately crave and need. And then there's Mm -hmm. a certain kind of attention that's just one click over from that that I absolutely want to avoid at all costs. And it's nonsensical because it would seem like you're either a person who wants attention or you don't want attention. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's like there are certain things where I'm like, I really want it. But then like somehow winning bingo when everyone else in the room lost potentially yeah. that's not a thing that makes me want to be like do a Hulk Hogan where I walk up to the thing mm-hmm. and I go mm, mm-hmm. and I listen to for all the Hulkamaniacs right. and I'm doing like I'm dabbing like mm-hmm. I don't that's not in me if in that situation it's more like I'm so sorry. I, I want to apologize mm-hmm. to everyone for existing. Yeah, right. I will of course accept the money, but I want you to know, I just want you all to know as I'm taking this money I do hate myself. Yes, right. So yeah. as to kind of blunt the emotional pain for all of you about not being the winners of this, I just want you to know this will go straight into uh, pull tabs and alcohol mm-hmm. and other right. self-destructive things. <laughs> right. If that helps and any none of, of it you will process go to therapy. this, none of this I will promise go to therapy, you Bill. this will only make my life worse if that uh-huh. in any way improves your experience here at this Eagles tonight. <laughs> right, that yeah. would be like living in my head, you know? So, and in fact... Again, I don't want to. How do I? I the the people that are kind of like winning and they're just like doing a little, you know, they're 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 doing the running man as they enter mm. the stage or whatever. Or they're like enjoying themselves. That's a more normal response. Yeah, I think so we're, too. Yeah, we're right. all here. We're having fun. Something good has happened mm-hmm. for this person. Now we're celebrating. The fact that for me it would be a moment of almost deep embarrassment mm-hmm. gets into a much more complicated. <laughs> an unhealthy sense of of who I am in the world and my relationship with things like gambling and gambling. Yeah, it's funny because I, I thought that I would be more shy. But the way you describe it and your complicated feelings about it, I almost wonder if you would loathe going up there more than me. And again, I don't even loathe. I wouldn't That's like not even it. the right word. I don't. But I I seriously when it's like a, when it's for like 40 bucks or something, I'm just like I'm part of me. I think I think sometimes I seriously think I hope I don't win. I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it's like I'm just kind of it's not part of the calculation for me to think about. You don't what get a bed for, for no. more than 40 do- yeah, for less I know than $40. it really makes me sound it really makes me sound like a like <laughs> some sort of Scrooge McDuck situation but like I am a little bit shy again I'm not mortified but I am a little bit shy about those kinds of things and what the proper reaction should be yeah I I even when I've been in a casino setting now here's the thing the weird part is it also has to do with the game like if I was playing blackjack where it's me against the the dealer or the house and I win I could be very excited and I wouldn't feel mm-hmm. um, you know a sense of embarrassment about that or certainly roulette I could get really excited if I win it's just that zero sum nature of a game like bingo I think where you winning means most everyone else didn't win there's something about that dynamic that makes me feel that would that just makes me feel less than just like triumphant in the moment, I guess. You were talking about the part of my personality that sort of feels like or always felt like I, I, I'm I'm always going to lose anyway. Because I remember being I remember saying this like as a as a young person. I don't know if it was high school or college, but saying like, no, I don't because I never had any interest in gambling of any sort. And I always said, I don't need another way to lose things. <laughs> <laughs> but oh. I know I was kind of kind of and kidding yet, on the square. There and yet I could have used a little bit of that in my life. It would have served <laughs> yeah, me right. well. But it, but I wasn't bullied enough and therefore 
have lost a lot of money gambling over Well, speaking of bullying, I mean, that's the that's one thing that still lives in my head. And I know that this is an answerable thing. But the other thing that really um, inoculated me from a gambling addiction was and I know I think this makes you wince a little bit and I don't mean to. It has nothing to do with you other than the fact that like you and I were hanging out a lot and like I wanted to learn blackjack. And mm. and I knew that you and I were going to go to Goldie's. And I was going to play blackjack against like real people like I think I learned it on my actual iPad and like and then one afternoon after we got off our radio job or something we went to uh, Goldie's and I think that my first experience was good it was maybe me and one other player I don't know I, I, I haven't played blackjack in so long I can't even remember sort of the ins and outs of like what my own personal like kind of rules or policies were um, but like I remember the first experience being really fun and being like oh this is great but then the next time I went there I think also with you but you might have been at another table or something there I was playing and there were a few other people at the blackjack table and I did something you know as a novice that pissed off the other people at the table at least one guy started muttering at mm -hmm. me why'd you yeah. do that you screw me and I like and the thing is I'm so bad at understanding like kind of the the calculations of math and cards that I still don't understand it and you could explain to me now and it'll go over my head but like I was listening to the Levitard show I don't know a few weeks ago or something um, it was actually during the Super Bowl because the, their whole gang was down in Vegas and they were trading uh -huh. stories or whatever and they were like talking about that experience from both sides of it but I think mostly uh -huh. from the perspective of people they are people who know how to play blackjack and they were sort of complaining when other people play a card that F's the table and I'm like I still cannot do that because I would not understand I do not understand how my personal actions affect other people in that scenario every other scenario I'm yeah. uber focused on that <laughs> but in blackjack I don't understand it bro well you you're your your instinct is actually correct in terms of on the macro level a person taking a card that they quote unquote are not supposed to take does not change the fortune of the table over the course of the entire shoe of cards. But on a micro level in that particular round, let's just say that uh, there's a, the, the dealer is showing a five. That's a terrible card for the dealer because we think in blackjack, every card we can't see is a 10. Mm -hmm. So we think the dealer has a 15 and then we think the next card the dealer is going to take, if it's a 10 or worth 10 mm -hmm. is 25 and they bust. So when you see the dealer sitting on a, with a five face up, the theory is, and again, remember you can't actually see, you cannot see the card that's underneath and you cannot see the next card that's coming out for the dealer. So this is all, Already we're getting into the realm of kind of squishy mm -hmm. data analysis. But this idea is that like when the dealer is in a disadvantageous position, you do certain things. And as opposed to when the dealer has a face card showing and we assume then that the dealer's got 20, yeah. et cetera. But again, this theory does not bear out a lot of the time. It's not, I mean, if it was ironclad, there would just be professional blackjack players that would just clock in and play blackjack all day. Like all of this is just kind of the, the best guess that you can make. And maybe if you did it 10,000 times, statistically it would come out slightly, you know, in the, in favor of what you're trying to do. That being said, like it's a really, it can be a frustrating feeling if you have a lot of money out and somebody does takes a hit, somebody in that little round of play does something that's against the sort of prevailing wisdom and it causes something better to happen for the house. Like it causes the dealer to then, when they turn that card that's under their five over, it's a 10. Now they have 15. We're thinking, sweet, they're going to get 25, but the next card they pull is a six. Now they've got 21. And everyone wants to look over at that person who hit their 13 mm. against the five because they changed the mojo and the, the literally the card that came out. So in the short term, you can get really sort of mad at someone, but in the long term, now two hands later, when that same person who was pissed, when they get a 21, they wouldn't have had that 21. Yeah, right, if they're still if dealing, not for, yeah, right. It's all connected, and so that's where it's, to me, there's a sort of a fallacy there of, you blame someone when something bad happens, and I mean, I've been so guilty of this, that's the sad part. I have absolutely, in fact, it's part of, I don't play, you know what, when when I am at the casino, which mercifully has been a lot less in the last few years, but um, when I've been at the casino, I don't even play table games very much anymore because the problem is that there are human beings involved and it, it's mm. an opportunity for me to be frustrated with human beings, mm. whether it's other players, whether it's the dealer. I mean, the dealer is not doing anything wrong. They're literally turning the cards over, but there can be 
this feeling, particularly after a certain amount of alcohol or if there's a certain amount of money in play where you're, fr you're bummed about the outcome and if you're being immature, as I am sometimes um, sort of, you know, unfortunately capable of being, you want to attach it to someone. It's either another player at the table who did the wrong thing or it's, God, this dealer, man, you're just killing me right now. And I don't like that side of me. And I don't, I, so I will play slot machines even though they're worse odds because I don't even get, I don't get mad at the robot. I'm mm -hmm. like, the, the robot's doing what, the robot's going to do what robot's going to do. But like, it's, on, it's honestly caused me to go away from table games because I don't like the feeling that I get if I go on a losing streak and I start getting mad at human beings around this because... This is totally my decision to be there. Um, and so all that is to say, I'm, I'm, I'm bummed that somebody ruined your blackjack experience by, by sniping at you over your play. Because really, and, and you'll listen to people, like you'll hear people, and they're almost always a person who's at the casino way too much. And they'll be like, if the table plays together, we'll beat the house every time. And I'm like, is that why you took the bus here? <laughs> hey, and I don't say hey, that. That's, hey, hey, that's not a slam on the E-line. <laughs> It's not a what? slam on public transportation. If you, if you see me at Shorty's, I can almost guarantee you I took the bus there because it's right up the road from me. I'm I'm not. Uh, <laughs> you mean Goldie's? Goldie's. But sorry, I, I'm not. That's not a slam on public transportation. Right, right. That's 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 saying that there. This is a person who's the finan Their financial fortunes mean, maybe right, have yeah. not. But I do. But actually, you know what? This. But that is a good. That's a good reminder that maybe like taking part of what we need to do is not have it like <laughs> you took the bus here. Is, yeah, yeah. Or right. like it's it means that things in your life are not going well. Let's just say oftentimes the people that are most vociferously making the argument at the blackjack table that if the team, the, the players just play together, you're going to win every time. It's like nothing about any of our financial fortunes here indicate to me that that is a factual statement. Right. So let me ask you this, though. By the way, it just occurred to me the other day. I am so bad, even though this show is us talking about little events in our life. I got to say, I let some things go through the cracks. We're not going to get into this now because I've already told my whole boring bingo story and we have the rest of our lives that's trade stories. But how did I not even tell you about the time in this winter when a guy started screaming at me on the bus because he thought I was trying to kill him with my big ass hands? I will tell you uh, that story someday. Whoa. That was a very I, scary I moment. That was the only like truly scary moment I've ever had on a bus. Because you, because you got some grief over your camera one time. Yeah, some guys that. were like teasing me, and they kept on asking me if I was a, a bounty hunter. I guess they saw my camera and were like, wow. and I was wearing some dress shoes, and I was sitting in the back of the E line. Um, but that, even that, felt like ribbing to me, where I had to like kind of keep eyes a little bit in the back yeah. of my head. But it felt like ribbing. I wasn't. There, yeah. But this was a scary situation with somebody who had wow. no control over their mind and um, was was wow. getting into my physical space. I'll tell you that story Whoa. another time. But I will um, ask you this, going back to Blackjack really quickly. So yes. uh, I, this is a two-part question. Uh, well, it's more of a it's more of a comment than a question. No. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, that story of us like playing um, or going to, to Goldie's and whatever afternoon that was back in 2013, Luke, or whatever it was. Oh, my God. Um, and like me kind of thinking like, OK, I really did not like that experience of being grumbled at at the table. You know me. I yeah. don't like being hollered at. I don't like getting in people's way. It just made me feel bad. Right. Yeah. And, I, and so I stopped. I've never played since. Uh, my questions for you are first. Have you at some sort of blackjack table been that person? I'm assuming it would be for higher stakes or something. But like you were really mad at that person when I told you about it later. And it's probably good that you weren't there because you probably would have headbutted him on my on my yes. account. <laughs> but have you been, whether it's at Vegas or, or, or a place like Goldie's, a card room or something, have you been the person who um, has maybe kind of grumbled or given somebody a hard time at blackjack? Or do you yeah. just look at blackjack differently than other table games? No, I have been that person. Uh, many times, and I don't like that about myself. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't do it now because I'm on high alert for it in myself. But in certainly in my in my younger days, in my in my drunker days, um, yeah, I would um, I would be I could be pretty pretty cutting and pretty mean to other people at the table mm. who I saw as you know kind of messing it up for people. Now the difference was I didn't ever think that the again that like somebody taking one card that was kind of maybe a bit of a risky move would then ruin the rest of the like entire evening of blackjack which is where i think it gets ridiculous mm -hmm. i do think you can argue that within within a specific event within one round of blackjack somebody doing something silly like taking a card that makes no sense mathematically based on whatever we know about what's happening mm -hmm. 
I do think that that's kind of annoying I, to this day. But like also the hitting the, the hitting on a 13 if the if the uh, dealer showing a five like that would be that would be worthy. bad for him. Yeah, because because it would the, the, again, the theory would be that the dealer is on their way to busting. And so if you take their bust card, we would say um, then and then they get a card that keeps them in the game. They get a six. So now they have 21 or whatever. That is like a very like you can kind of like the, the line is very from A to B on that is pretty easy to trace. And so that will be fr what I will usually do is if somebody is starting to do that a lot, I'll just kind of like quietly pick up stakes and move somewhere else mm. because I realize this is an opportunity for me to become a little bit frustrated. But if someone's just trying to learn, if someone's kind of new to it, like what I what I know about you, Andrew, is that I'm sure that you were profusely apologizing as the game was happening being like, hey, I'm still trying to figure out the ropes here, et cetera. And I think that the nice move there, if you're a fellow blackjack player and you've done it a lot, is to say to the person, hey, if, you, if, if, if you're curious and you kind of want to know what the like sort of theory on this stuff is, like, let me know, I'm happy to tell you, but also play your, play your game, do whatever you want. Like, that's a nice way to invite someone into a lifetime of financial <laughs> ruin instead of being mean to them, particularly when they're just trying to learn. Like that's that that's that's something I wouldn't do. Would be rude yeah. to someone who does who's just trying to figure out how to do this this game. Well, I'm sure I didn't I probably didn't like advertise that I was brand new, but if you sit at that table a lot, you could probably tell just by my body language. I'm sure I was just incredibly quiet. I'm sure I was like whisper quiet. Uh -huh. I, here's my second question for you. Do you think, because I've heard somebody say this, but I'm wondering if they're a reliable narrator, because it might have been Genevieve, and she might just have a different experience with this. Like, Genevieve learned how to play blackjack on her phone or whatever before some quasi-recent trip to Vegas, and then played in Vegas a couple of times, and she didn't experience any of that sort of aggression. Now, mm -hmm. it could be that she just knows those rules better than me, but my guess is she probably had about the same knowledge that I did going in, um, but she says that Vegas is going to be more forgiving i think it was yep. her it might have been somebody else but like a vegas is going to be more forgiving because you have a whole bunch of bubble gummers as opposed to like let's just say i was like playing blackjack on aurora at goldie's at like 3 30 p.m mm -hmm. the people i'm playing against in goldie's right there are probably people who are playing not, aggressively is maybe the wrong word but like they're really chasing something exactly the energy in Vegas, I was just in Vegas a couple of weeks ago. The energy is, particularly if you're like on the strip, if you're in the kind of like bigger casino hotel things, the energy is way different. People are on vacation. People, typically people, you know, had the resources to get a plane ticket to get there. Maybe they're at a work convention and they're take. maybe they're at the Concrete World convention mm -hmm. and they're just, you know, unwinding from that. Like it's a, it's a convention. It's, it's a, and a, a, that they never go to. Yes. Maybe they're trying to reassemble their own credit card that they cut in half <laughs> because they wanted to not take out more money. But then, you know, but, it, but the, the energy is, is, is usually pretty festive. I mean, with some exceptions, but yeah. at, at, in Vegas, in those casinos, people are kind of partying. And when you're at a local card room that's very close to where a lot of people live and like on the way home from work or um, a, a, a quick bus ride away, you get a really different mm -hmm. vibe I, yeah. I i think that those in fact that's one of the things that i i mean lots of people lose a lot of money in vegas that they probably shouldn't lose but i think it's actually a very unsophisticated it's a sort of unsophisticated take i was talking to someone and they'll remain nameless because they're actually kind of like in an extended version of my family but like they were talking about like everyone just going to vegas and just losing their mortgage on their house and i was like it's not who it is yeah like that's not what's happening there like the the the, the real danger to most people's Financial well-being as it relates to gambling is the state lottery, the Powerball, these little machines they have in Oregon in every gas station and every bar where you can, for $1.50 a spin or $2 a spin, you can just donk off a mm -hmm. bunch of money. It's these little, in my opinion, it's these micro events that are really like it's Goldie's, you know, for some people. It's these things that are easy to get to and close by and open all day long and available for you to try to interact with when you're trying to numb out some feeling or do something emotionally for yourself that that you're not capable of self-soothing with. Yeah. That's not everybody who's in there, but I'm just saying for the people that it's for whom it's a problem. That's the bigger thing. It's not, you know, some people sitting around at the Venetian playing blackjack. Mm -hmm. That's again, I'm not saying it's great for them either, but that's not really where the 
financial lives are being ruined at nearly the rate that it's happening in these small, very unglitzy moments of, of, of small gambling interactions. Is my, it, that's my opinion. And if it is happening in Vegas, it's not at the places that these folks are going to, right? They're private no. places off the strip somewhere where you might have, you know, like you, I could see like Vegas having a bunch of locals there who are very much like <laughs> well, very that's, much. I mean, that's happening in a terrible yeah. gas station that also has a slot machine. Right. Like exactly. you drive out to Summerland and you find me a terrible's gas station that has four slot machines. It's in actually it. called terrible's. Huh? Yeah. It's like and and no, no, I will. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> what should we name our gas station? Terrible's. Yep. Sounds great to me. Terrible's. <laughs> Thanks for not asking. <laughs> We got to do it. How many um, show titles of TVTL are some sort of spoof a lot. on terrible things for things for a asking? lot, a lot, yes. a lot. But like but like, yeah, that's those like f find me uh, even like the, the bar that we went to when you and I went to Vegas and we parked the RV, whatever, mm -hmm. five aces or something. Yeah, that is a place where it is to me more likely that somebody is coming in and and having a probably unhealthy financial relationship with those video poker machines that we were sitting at. Yeah. That's more typical. Again, this is not to say that everything that happens in those big glitzy casinos is is financially great for people. It's financially bad for everyone who goes in there, generally speaking. But Except it's just Andy a, Garcia in, in Ocean's, Ocean's 11. Yes. 12. <laughs> yes. I always forget right. which one he was in. He's yeah. in the first one. I see the main bad the guy in the first one. one. I, well, bad guy or Mark? Now that I think about it, like, is it a bad guy because you don't want he's your a bad guy? Because he's a bad guy, well, though. They yeah, make him so. mean to Julia Roberts, I think. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I think you've got to make him bad in, uh, in order to root for which the Which makes us, makes us root, be yeah. rooting for those Ocean the Ocean Boys. Yeah. And and um, anyway. Emotion okay, well, that's uh, 50 minutes wow. and 48 seconds Jeez on please. gambling. Uh, and um, if anybody wants more on this, I am starting a Patreon podcast um, called Games of Chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to be putting that out. And for uh, you know those who want to subscribe to it, uh, please uh, hit me up. I'm starting a sub stack. <laughs> I am thinking, oh, my God, I was talking to Cheryl Strayed this weekend, like, off air. Oh, yeah. You know, she has a sub stack. She has a, she has a newsletter. I didn't know that, but yeah. It's got nine over 97,000 subscribers. Jeez Louise. Now, I don't know what the, you know, you can subscribe to it for free and just get the email. You can you can do kind of a TBTL thing where you, you know, donate five bucks a month or pay in this case. There's different levels of access. Yeah. But, like, if a fractional amount of those people are, are doing the... Uh, you know the 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 the, the for-profit version of it. I'm like, this is radically changing how we're making content. Yeah, yeah. I I follow like, a few of those. Yeah, I do too. I I get Lindy's. I subscribe to Lindy. Oh, West. nice, nice. Yeah, I, heard uh, I think great. it's called Butt News. It it's is. really good. It is it really is. good. Would yeah. would recommend. So I'm you know, but uh, but anyway, um, I'm gonna start mine where I just. I just describe. I need to figure out a way to recoup a significant amount of money from the last twenty years of my life lost to gambling by generating <laughs> more gambling content. Could it be called I Got a System? We was hoping for some razzle dazzle. Razzle dazzle. That's right, man. Razzle dazzle. On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody razzle dazzle. Hey, let's thank some dazzling donors. You know, Andrew, in these turbulent times, the only good financial decision is supporting TBTL. Hey, Luke. It's a sure bet. It sure is. <laughs> and we are so, so grateful because it's how we're able to do TBTL for our jobs is because of the supporters, including today's first dazzling donor. It's our pal, Rold Palomaria. Oh, Rold. I have some, I have some questions for you. Rold works in the um, grocery store industry. Yeah. And I always have questions. I'm trying to think, have I raised this on the show already? I, maybe I have, but you know, though, Roll, this is directly to you. Before we read your message, I have a question for you that I don't know if I've asked you, but every time I'm in the grocery store and I see this, I think about you. Um, you know, sometimes you see people restocking things in like the produce section or maybe mm -hmm. even like the deli section or something. There's these carts that people are pushing around, and some of them have signs stuck on them that say day use only. With an exclamation point, and it seems so so important to somebody at the grocery store that these carts are only used during the day, and I, I I don't understand why the night shift is not allowed to use these carts. What is with the day use only emphasis on these carts? Rolled, get at me. 
Uh, World, we need you not just for financial support, but for intel into right. this into this business model. Uh, and uh, we would appreciate that. Rold's in North Bend, Washington, by the way, with his awesome fam, mm -hmm. who we also love. Rold says, hi, guys. My youngest five, Val, in his short four years of life, no. has had numerous medical issues and has developmental and speech delays. For the longest time, my wife and I were frustrated that the doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. Then in February this past year, we were fortunate enough to be included in a study at Seattle Children's where they did genetic testing. And Val was diagnosed with a newly discovered and rare genetic mutation called CDK13, which finally gave us an explanation of what was going on. The great doctors of Seattle Children's gave us a plan to follow because there could be more complications to come. I shared a slideshow of Val's journey so far in the Stens Facebook on CDK13 Awareness oh. Day, which is September 2nd. Of course, the tens were encouraging and caring, so thanks, friendos. Uh, Val is getting the services he needs and is thriving. So advocate for yourself and your family and don't get discouraged. And thanks, you guys, for all you do. Listening to you always makes my day. Wow. Rolled. Again, um, as if we need more examples of the tens community being just an awesome place, I'm, my guess is, and I, I didn't see this sort of communication chain with Rold talking about CDK 13 awareness, but knowing the tens, I'm sure that this was a really supportive place for Rold and his family and probably some really good information from Rold for other folks that may um, potentially deal with this or have, you know, other people they know that, that have kids that are dealing with CDK 13. It just, it makes me really happy that there is a place that would be the Stens page and the community of Stens where mm -hmm. Rold can go and kind of, again, share this information with them. And I'm assuming get some really comforting feedback from folks. And if I can be completely honest with you, Luke, if I had pre-read this message, I might have rethought my lead in about the day use only carts a little bit. I didn't oh, you realize think? it. <laughs> The one time I didn't have the dazzling donor in front of me because I had to restart my computer and I'm doing a lead in on grocery carts for kind of a serious message. Although I'm really Rold glad contains to hear multitudes. Exactly. Rold is both dealing with the real life stuff. As somebody said to me recently when I was somewhere, life be life in. Mm hmm You know, life be life in for Rold and his family and, and, and in different ways for, for all of us and all of our listeners. I don't think that the fact that life be life in for old means that he doesn't have a thought on day use only carts. Uh, That's the beauty of this program, Andrew, is that we we cover the entire spectrum of the human experience. Yeah. Gambling, grocery carts, mm -hmm. family health stuff. Those are the three legs of this stool that is TBTL. Well, I'm excited to find out how I'm going to ruin this next one. <laughs> well, let's find out together. Maestro? On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody rattles, rattles. Hey, look who it is. It's Jamie Julian hey. of Columbia, Maryland. Jamie. Now, I don't know what's in Jamie's message. I hope this is okay as a lead. We've established that. <laughs> Jamie is the person who I believe kind of intertwined us with Tony Kornheiser's world for a little bit. Remember this Jamie that is a thing? little. Exactly. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Jamie says, last February when I decided to scale, uh, last February I had decided to scale back my donation so that I could set aside more money for my niece and nephew's college funds. But then I heard you were going independent and I scrapped that plan. After all, the kids can get student loans, like I did. But we listeners are TB, TB's only hope. Jamie, uh -huh. you've spoken the truth here in this message. <laughs> Honestly, what are you going to spoil? <laughs> you, what are you going to spoil these kids? I will tell you this. As a kid who is paying their own way in college. Actually, I can't finish that sentence because I was going to say, as a kid who was paying his own way in college, I took it a lot more seriously than my friends. But that's just not true. I was a very bad student, mm. even though I was paying for all of it myself. Um, I was, and it was probably because I was working a number of full-time jobs while, while going to college. But generally speaking, I don't think it's the worst thing for a person in college to have a little bit of, um, of their own kind of uh, investment tied up in it. So I think, if anything, Jamie, donating to TBTB 
is doing your niece and nephew a favor. It's teaching them important. Um, it's character building for them, really. So and you're welcome. TBTL for me is kind of like continuing education. Anyway, Luke just explained to me some of the ins and outs of blackjack and mm -hmm. it's kind of the vibes at, at various card tables. And like that yeah. was educational for me. And you supported that. So that's right. another way to look at that. And then this is where Jamie's message takes a serious turn. Mm -hmm. uh, this February, my dad died, and I knew that I'd made the right decision. Whenever I needed a break from reality, I put in my earbuds, I take a walk, and time bandit my way back to 2015 wow. to hang out with my imaginary friendos talking about whatever. I now know that TBTL isn't a luxury item. It's a necessity. You make us laugh, you keep us sane, you ease us through the hard times, and... Thank you. Uh, with my waning character allotment, I don't think I knew there was a character allotment for this. There is, yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, with my waning uh, character allotment, I'd like to plug Second Story Cards out of Washington, D.C. They employ folks experiencing homelessness to create unique and beautiful greeting cards. Every year I buy my holiday cards for the uh, holiday cards for the Tens Card Exchange oh, wow. from this wonderful company. Please check them out at secondstorycards.com. Hey, okay. Cool. This is so cool. I am 100 burger, 100 burger cent. Mm -hmm. I am 100% going to buy a bunch of cards from this place because have don't you have you experienced this, Andrew? I don't know what your um, card buying kind of I don't know approach system mm -hmm. is. I have figured out there's one place in Portland I like. It's called Oblation. It's kind of a little you know paper goods store that has some good cards that I like. What, what you know what I what I find not particularly useful would be the card section of your local grocery store or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've, I've migrated towards this oblation place because they have some cards that are, that feel more like kind of tonally what I would say in a card, whether it's a birthday message or sympathy or what have you. And so when I go down there, what I've started doing, and I think this is just maybe middle age, I'll buy like $50 or $80 worth of cards. Cause I'll be like, I'm going to need birthday cards for people. I'm going to need valentine's cards for, i'm gonna need cards and i'm if i don't do this right now i'm gonna be going down to the safeway in longview and trying to get something and that's gonna so anyway i've now become the kind of person who spends a lot on cards um and i might as well be getting them from somewhere that's helping support people who've been experiencing homelessness and i'm also looking at these cards and they're kind of great that's what i was going to say i'm on the website now i didn't know about this and i'm looking at them there some of these designs are really cute um a lot of them kind of kind of like cute little twee designs that i real that really speak to me to be honest with you luke i'm somebody who because i'm with you like when i was a kid we always had to send grandparents and relatives like you go to the literally go to the hallmark store and yeah. buy cards and then like i don't know i got to a certain age and it just sort of seemed like that just didn't seem like the vibe anymore but basically what that meant was I very rarely give people cards anymore yeah. like very occasionally Ooh. with a gift uh, a along with a gift to Genevieve but even like I'm trying to think I just gave her a um, birthday gift I don't think I gave her a card to go along with it so whoa um, my, yeah, just, my I, guy I, I, I thought we were just done with cards honestly I thought the internet sort of um, stopped that but I'm looking at this and it's proving me wrong because this literally makes me want to buy cards and I'm not just saying yeah they're that. good right yeah like they're, they're funny. They're not hokey. I mean, I think that's probably for our generation where we are probably the first generation, Andrew, who were like these part of why I think you're sensing that the, you thought we're not doing cards anymore is because most of the cards that we would get, we would get, get and give as kids mm -hmm. sucked and they were saccharine and they were not, they just didn't feel like, uh, they they felt hokey to us. They felt corny, and we were probably the first generation that that wanted to expect that expected more out of our greeting cards or our like. This isn't just something that says like you know, as you walk through the journey of life, may you forever find the blessings. Happy birthday! In like a curt like a you know ridiculous cursive writing kind of thing or whatever. Like we are the first generation that was like, no, that's not enough. That doesn't work. And so you could either try to get into cooler cards, or you could just kind of like opt out of it. It sounds like you opted out. I opted out, but I'm opting back in because right now I'm looking at a very cute little illustrated card that says, the only thing I hate more than being away from you are people yeah. who park in the bike lane. Oh. And this speaks to me. This speaks yeah. to me deeply, deeply. Thanks for letting us know about this, Jamie, and thanks for Thanks, Jamie. And sorry Appreciate to hear about your you. father as well. Yeah. 
yeah i hope that you're hope that you're doing as okay with that as any of us can do around loss it's um it's not as you know a, a straight line as far as the grieving process it it, it jumps around a lot. So I hope you're having, as you hear this, one of those more okay days with it. And rolled as well to you and your family. We're thinking about you and we really appreciate you. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to both of our dazzling donors today. Hello and welcome to Top Story. So we had the big 20th anniversary celebration of the radio show that I, that I host called Livewire um, over the weekend in Portland. And it was a Boy, was it a hoot nanny! Tell you, we had like it was basically two shows. First, there was this in the in the daytime. There was this this kind of look back at the history of the show, where I was interviewing the original host and also the co-founders of the program. And then that was really fun. Then there was a bunch of sketch comedy from our our sketch troupe that we had for a lot of years. And then and then it was like uh, outfit change, and then time to do the main radio show that night. Um, which was really fun. It was like a packed house. We were at Revolution Hall, which is a bigger venue than we're normally at. I think it's about maybe 850 or something. And it was sold out, which was, I have to be honest with you, a good feeling, you yeah, know? Yeah. Like, I've really tried to, I've really tried to um, separate my sense of, of the show and a particular week of the show with have we sold a bunch of tickets or not, because those are not necessarily related. We can do a really great radio show if we have a fairly light attendance and we can do a bad radio show with a packed house, like I've tried to not see that as a referendum on me. Um, and I've actually made some progress in that. I'm pretty sanguine about the whole thing now. Like we're doing the show at town hall in Seattle in two weeks on a Friday. And I haven't even asked once how the ticket sales are going, hmm. which is big for me. That's progress. But I wasn't mad when I heard that, like we were totally sold out for this 20th anniversary show. And that actually plays into this moment that I did not expect from the night, which is normally when we do the show, we often do it at a place in Portland called the Alberta Rose Theater. And it's a smaller venue. I think it's maybe like 400 people. And I feel like we kind of almost know everyone in the room by uh -huh. now. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who buy season tickets and people who come to a lot of shows. And the energy is lovely. It just feels like you're hanging out with your friends. And um, it's a really, really good vibe. And the vibe was really great on Saturday night at Revolution Hall, but it's more people. And we run a we ran a ton of promos on OPB. So I think this was one of those unique cases where we just brought in some folks that were maybe not familiar with our show or didn't have the kind of real close relationship with the show and with me that a lot of the people that come to our, our regular things do. And so I'm talking to, we're interviewing Cheryl Strait. It's really it, towards the end of the show. And Cheryl was, of course, she's the person who wrote the book Wild, which became the movie Wild. She's an um, advice columnist. She writes as Dear Sugar. Um, uh, she's uh, Dear Sugar, which is a TV show starring Katherine Hahn, basically, kind of as Cheryl Strait. Anyway, Cheryl Strait is the best. I love her so much. She is like, I, this is a word that I don't use a lot. Uh, unironically, she's like wise. She's like a mm. wise person. Mm. And I feel like her writing has that in it and just talking to her. She's she's like an empath, man. She just like she just uh she's just someone whose energy is really really good to be around. And she wrote this essay recently about her late mother-in-law. And it's really beautiful and it's just talking about how the kind of complicated her relationship was with her husband's mother and and, and the things about her husband's mother that were hard for her to kind of come to terms with. And then also when her husband's mother, when her mother-in-law was approaching the end of her life, the way that their relationship changed for the better, became deeper and more loving. It, it's a, you know, it's a really lovely essay per usual from Cheryl Strait. So we're talking about this and, and we're talking about the, 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 the things about her mother-in-law that were also kind of not ideal for her. Like one time when Cheryl was pregnant, I believe, or maybe just coming off of being pregnant, uh, her mother-in-law gave her a Weight Watchers gift certificate. Jesus. Not, you know, a thing that probably feels great. And she writes about that. So we're talking about this. And out of, of the absolute blue, I hear a noise coming from the balcony. Like a kind of almost like, initially it felt like, you know, when someone is in the British like house of 
lords. <laughs> yes. like, like when somebody like says something, you know, when the right honorable whatever mm-hmm. from wherever is talking about some potential rule change and then all the people from the other party are like he's in a low voice and he's pounding like i just heard a noise like that from the and i i was initially i you know i didn't really understand what was going on i thought somebody was maybe having a something happened for them maybe something medical i wasn't quite sure and i saw cheryl kind of look up and then a person a woman's voice came down yelling like why are you saying this about her? And we all just kind of froze. And then Cheryl kind of looked at me and I, I was like, um, I was not exactly sure what to do at that moment. And Cheryl kind of started to answer the question sort of to me and Elena on stage a little bit. And then sort of someone saying, else, like I talk about this stuff because blah, 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 just sort of answering that woman's question without like directly engaging yes, with kind uh, of, uh, somebody who's being inappropriate in the audience. Yeah. And then, but kind of to us and then mm-hmm. someone else in the audience, I think was trying to heckle the woman, mm-hmm. but it was hard. So then a person in the audience, I think kind of starts booing the woman who was heckling us but that was hard to interpret where that boo, like if the boo was coming towards us or if it was going towards the person who was heckling Cheryl or whatever. And then the person who the heckler number one, like sort of continued on with this sort of saying things to the stage. And, um, and I had this moment where I kind of was thinking somebody should really do something about this. <laughs> And then I realized, oh, I'm the person that should really do something about this, you know? Like, I, 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 in talking about it after the show with people, because by the way, Andrew, it became essentially the only thing anyone wanted to talk about with me after the program. Mm. Not the fact that the radio show has been around for 20 years and that we've had the good fortune of all these amazing guests and everything. It was like, wow, that was weird when that person started acting up. Mm-hmm. That became the main thing that we were all talking about. But I had that moment... And I, I wonder if you have had it, maybe at pop up, maybe in other professional se- in, in professional settings, or even just in your life, where you are in a, a moment where you're thinking, well, I guess whoever's in charge of this is going to need to do something, mm-hmm. or okay, well, this is it's time for the adults to take over mm-hmm. and make a call here, and you do a quick kind of assessment and you realize you're the adult, <laughs> and like. That's always kind of a stunning realization because for so much of our life, when we're younger, you just get, you're used to, there's a grown up somewhere who knows what to do. There's somebody older than you with more authority. Who's going to basically say, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're not doing. And you can kind of like hand it off to them. Mm-hmm. And then there's a point in your life where you realize in whatever that moment that is for you. Oh shit. That's me. Isn't it? Mm. And that entire thing went through my mind sitting up there on stage as this person was acting up, which is going on for about how long. And I, I ask that knowing that it feels uh-huh. even longer, of course, but like in all reality, from the moment this person's first started heckling and then sounds like continued to heckle, even when the booze were raining down or whatever, it, this whole thing goes on 15, 20, 30 seconds. Pro- I'd say 40 seconds tops. Okay, yeah. Which is a I, long, that feels like a really long time, like, it, you know, in this situation. The number, I mean, the, the number of different things that your brain, the number of different scenarios that the human brain can cycle through in a matter of just a few seconds is really something, right? And the scenarios that cycled through my head were, do we have security? Do I ask the crowd to literally physically remove the person. Wait, is that way too, is that an over response? Do I get, do I walk down on the stage? Do I go upstairs and ask them to leave? Do I, do, do I ask, like, do I, um, ask them to stop talking, but, uh, answer their question myself? Do I ask Cheryl to answer their question? Like, Oh, I played out all these different scenarios of how to sort of try to deal with this. And what I landed on was, I asked Cheryl, I was like, is that a question that you feel? Basically, the heckler was saying, why are you putting your mother-in-law on Front Street? Mm -hmm. Which I will just say, I don't think that that heckler is going to hear this. But what I would say to that person is, and I'm going to use a profanity here, read the fucking essay. Mm -hmm. 
Like it was, not only did it make me feel unhappy that it kind of put a, it cast a little bit of a shadow on things for that moment, but it was so unbelievably disrespectful because if this person had read the thing that they were commenting on, they would understand just how off base they were. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's the height, the height of disrespect to in a room full of people that are enjoying themselves or, you know, being informed in a certain way to decide that it's your job to yell something to the crowd or to the stage when you have not even actually read the source material that you're essentially commenting on. That was like the thing that made me the most annoyed mm -hmm. because if this person had read the essay, they would understand how off base their, their criticism was. And, I, a, and to be clear, you're not, you don't expect everybody who comes to a live taping of Livewire or any other interview show to have done homework. You're not, you're no. not saying that in order to enjoy this, no. that you need to do that. But for you, to I insert, haven't read the book. Yeah. <laughs> in order for you, for you as somebody who's in the audience, I mean, the only way would be like if you were interviewing somebody of, of uh, you know, you know, who is very controversial, and there's somebody who is like, you know, like literally there to protest to hopefully shine a light yeah. on something, you know, like yeah. that. But like, in in that case, yeah, you better have read the person's material so you know where they're coming at. But that, obviously, that is not the situation here. For you just to be at this live taping and then be like, well, I I don't know if I like this this guest's uh, approach to their interpersonal relationships with their mother-in-law, and you're just going to yeah. interject yourself. That is infuriating. It's so it's so rude. And again, it's it's so off base because having read the essay as I did, it's lovely and it's a love letter to this person who was complicated in the way that we are all complicated mm -hmm. at hum as humans. So where I ended up landing with it was I turned to Cheryl and again, it felt like I was sitting there dumbstruck for about four hours, but I think it was probably less than 10 seconds. And I just said to Cheryl, um, do you feel comfortable answering that question? And she said, yeah. And she sort of, looked up into the crowd and she answered the question of why, of, of, of what her intentions were in writing about her mother-in-law in this way. And, and I said, would you, do you feel comfortable answering the question? She said, yeah. And before she started, I said, and I just want to be, <laughs> I looked up at the, I couldn't see the person, but I looked up into that section. And I said, and I want to be really clear with you right now. This is your one question. Yes, this is not a dialogue. I was going to say you have to you have to say like because in a certain way now you've given this person like oh yes. hey look look what I I got what I want is this a Q and A yeah now people can just yeah. start just shouting out questions yeah yeah so I and I don't think I realized how stern I was being hmm. I because of course internally I'm like oh, this all feels not great you know what I mean like I don't what this is not the energy we're trying to have on our 20th anniversary show. You know, like, like, I don't like, I don't want to be, I don't want to have to be adversarial with an audience member or be, be, be sort of, again, like a, I don't know, an authority figure. Like, that's not what I'm trying to do. But I, so the reason I, I, I'm, I'm realizing that I was sort of a little more authoritative than I meant to be was because I couldn't believe how many people afterwards were like, Wow. Never saw that side of you before. Hmm. That's interesting because the quote yeah. you just gave me does not seem over the top. It must have been in your tone. But I whatever think, the tone was, I back you up on it because if you weren't firm there, trust me, I don't know who this person was, but they would have <laughs> taken more. I think they would have, and they didn't, thankfully. And also, I want to say huge credit to Elena Passarello, who's the other, uh, the sort of co-host of the show, because and Elena is a writer and uh, and teaches English at Oregon State University, and jumped in with a really interesting question that was relevant to what we were talking about, but kind of moved sort of like was, was tied into what we were talking about, but also moved the conversation along mm -hmm. a bit. So we didn't get bogged down mm -hmm. and it kind of worked well because I had just now been like the, I had sort of been the bad cop of being like, and we're not having this right now, mm -hmm. you know, revolution hall, one person at revolution hall. So she sort of jumped right in with a question that I think the, I think the whole thing kind of worked itself out. Okay, we didn't hear anything else from the peanut gallery. We finished the interview. I think it was a good night for, uh, you know, an, an entertaining night and an informative night. Um, but I got the, 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 the Livewire staff has started forwarded me. There was, I guess, at least a couple of emails from people who were like, hey, I was in the crowd and I just wanted to say, like, appreciate how you all handled that. And mm -hmm. also like, huh, 
never seen Luke be like that before. Mm. So now I'm like, I mean, I guess I could, you know what? There's a very easy way for me to find out what the actual vibe was, which is I could just get them to send me the raw tape of the show, I guess. Yeah, uh, do you want to I will not that? do that. I want to hear that. I'm wondering I if I will you not to. be doing that, yeah. but I guess I could. This is one situation where it's extremely knowable for me what the vibe was. I mean, to be honest with you, I was already mildly out of my body in that moment, as you mm -hmm. might imagine. Like, and, and so I... I don't. I don't know how it was coming off. I mean, it was. It worked. Whatever. Whatever happened, it stopped the, the 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 dialogue that we weren't trying to have with the audience, and we moved on. And I think things were sort of fine. But um, to take it back to the bingo conversation, I did not have that on my bingo card for yeah. Saturday night. Having to having to shut down a heckler during of all people, Cheryl Strait, the a person who only brings light and love mm -hmm. into the world as she talks about her experience. I mean, it was just completely unexpected. Are you guys still using the Hell's Angels as your security too? Is that starting next week there? at okay. Town Hall in Seattle? Be careful. Yeah, we've got Sonny it's Barger's spicy. grandson. <laughs> what was I don't even know what festival there was some disastrous festival right back in the 1960s yeah. was it it wasn't yeah, it, um, it was the Rolling Stones it was Altamont 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 yes it was Altamont yeah I forgot about that yeah um, we uh, I think we're gonna just go 10 more or maybe 20 more years before we get another heckler exactly you're gonna set up plan. you're gonna set up like protocols for it next time and then you well, have those protocols and then they're never but it's better to have them I guess than not it's I better to have it, them and not need them, I guess. I guess, but I mean, it's it. it what the other thing I was I, that I was sort of reflecting on as it was all happening was, and again, this is how the human brain can think of so many things in just a split second. I was thinking to myself, how have I never been through this before on this mm. show? Mm -hmm. Like, and maybe it has happened a long time ago and I forgot, or maybe it's happened when the stakes were not feeling as high. Like, I really wanted this show to go well. It was a big night for us, and so. Maybe it felt extra kind of weird because of the larger context of the of that episode of the show. But like, all I was thinking was, "Huh, I'm surprised I don't have a better system for this." Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised this hasn't happened more. Okay, I guess. We can, and, and then my brain's going, "Yeah, these are a bunch of good people." Generally, I do like these. Like, I'm just thinking all of this stuff in the like two seconds between somebody saying something to Cheryl Strait and me trying to figure out what the next move is. There was, I had sort of the opposite experience. I mean, opposite in that I was in the audience for starters. So sort of the inverse, but, um, I was at a taping of a podcast, I don't know, earlier this winter um, that our friends put on, The Greatest Generation is what it's called, uh -huh. it's the Star Trek podcast, and um, our buddies host that, Genevieve, uh, is, is friends with both the guys who host that, and um, and, and I am to a degree. Um, but anyway, we're in the audience and Adam, the host who I don't know as well, I'm good friends with Ben, but I don't know Adam, the other host that well, um, he had to address some heckle and it wasn't like heckling like negative or uh -huh. even like pushing back in this way and again it's just a it's a comedy podcast about star trek right like the stakes are are, are are not super high but i think you just had a bunch of people in the room with a lot of i mean these are people who adore ben and adam right and they don't have a chance to talk back they listen to the podcast right. all the time and and when it, it's you know it's the type of podcast that that we do and that a lot of people do where it's a million in inside jokes. I don't get them because I'm not a Star Trek person. I don't really listen to it, but I can identify the structure of a joke. Usually I can tell that that's a joke that I don't get or whatever. But like for these folks who just like feed on this and like in Genevieve is probably amongst them, you know, who probably spoof along with the podcast while they're listening. And the, the beauty of, of shows like that is the connection to the audience and that the audience feels like they're listening to their best friends and they're part of the conversation. But when you put all that energy into a room together, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, one person might get too excited and then say something and then that sort of opens it can potentially open up the floodgates for everybody to think that this is okay to like kind of like offer your own little spoof from the audience and I remember sort of this was at the Neptune so that's a you you and I have done shows at the Neptune together and of course you've done live wire there I don't know how big that crowd is Luke if it's just the floor like what is that like a few hundred people maybe yeah the I think floor the floor is the I think the floor is like uh I feel like the floor might be 400 okay so you know it's probably something around that it's not like the 800 or 900 that you were talking about last night but you know it feels like kind of a small intimate setting sort of um and then it's like if you don't shut down the first mm -hmm. suggested line from the audience or whatever then that person is more emboldened and other people are
people are more emboldened right. as well. And you like, start to and, lose control of the class. Yes. And like I'm sort of watching that happen a little bit, not to the point where I feel uncomfortable in the crowd. It doesn't seem super distracting to me, but it's it's distracting, you know. And mm-hmm. um, and I remember Adam ad- finally just addressed it in a way. And, I, and I'm sorry that I can't remember the exact quote because that would be that would be helpful in this case. But I feel like he couched it really well. I feel like mm-hmm. he said something like, hey, listen, you know, for better, for worse, a lot of these people came out to hear us tell jokes tonight. <laughs> like they don't get <laughs> they don't get to do. I, I don't know. It was something of that was both like it was like it was to my ear, gentle, self-deprecating a little bit, but telling people we're not doing this anymore. And yeah, I thought he yeah. handled it so deftly. And then when we were talking after the show, I realized he was pissed as hell. He was mm-hmm. so mad. He was like, I was just like, his, first of all, it was probably more acute to him. They might have, yes. you know, heard it more because they're on stage. Right. And so everybody's facing that direction. I don't know what's going on. It's not, it's not my performance, but like, I, I thought he did something. I thought he like handled it like kind of like in a disarming way that was kind of like perfect and didn't seem super aggressive to me. But I sort of found out later and I, I, I think it's okay to say this, um, but like, yeah, he was really upset by that and about yeah. just like in the disrespect and, and and that that people would just sort of like kind of like just feel like, oh, this is my show to ruin. basically. Well, that's yeah. And you're exactly right. The the calculation that you're making on stage in moments like that is how much is this bothering everyone and how much is it just bothering me? Mm-hmm. Luckily, with Livewire, that's really rare. Um, the uh, the the the, you know, idea of people kind of like talking and yelling things out, even in a supportive way, it's it's pretty it's a unbelievably like respectful nice crowd but i have been in other scenarios where maybe i'm hosting something like maybe a paid gig or whatever where it's also it's 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 complicated as the host because um because you can hear stuff a lot more than the audience can so sometimes mm-hmm. it makes the most sense to just power through because it's mm-hmm. not bugging the audience it's only bugging you and if you stop and make it a whole thing now you've brought everybody in on this now it's potentially weird for everyone um, but also there's also a point at which it does become distracting for the audience or you can't continue on. And then you have to like, you know, kind of, uh, crack down on it. But, but that's my, my usual thing is like something that happened actually a couple times. I don't know what they were passing out. I don't know if they were giving, if they were serving everyone in glass bottles or something, or like if it's just, it's Portland. So lots of people are bringing out hydro flasks. There was a few different times in the night and this will sometimes happen at the Rose as well, where it's like somebody knocked over a really loud sounding mm. drink. I assume it was a drink. It's like someone knocked over something that was metallic or glass. Mm. And I was just like, and again, in my head, I'm like, the, the immediate thought is, are they, are they serving things in glasses here? Like, this is a dark theater where we mm. like, you know, are what, like, why did you also, and then you kind of get annoyed. You're like, why did you put your hydro flask near your foot? Like, why didn't you handle like you, all of this is going through your brain really fast. And in those cases, it's generally just the best move is to just keep moving, you know, just like mm-hmm. don't keep stopping the show. Anytime something hits your ear weird. But, um, but, but yeah, there are those times where you have to kind of, I mean, I guess the good news for me now is I do think I have a system for dealing with this. If it ever happens again, which will be, basically what I did that night, but maybe with a little bit, maybe slightly refined. But now that I've been through it once, I'm like, okay, I kind of know how this goes. Like if this were to happen again, I think I would feel less kind of um, thrown by the whole thing Mm -hmm. because I would just be like, okay, this is somebody's yelling at the guest and I'm going to like, here's how, here's what I'm going to do about that. Although it might take on its own contours each time. You know, hopefully not. Older. I hope hopefully it's exactly yeah, the same. You, I don't want, you're ready I don't want it. to develop a system for each and every kind of. <laughs> well, it is the type of thing where I, I do think and, and that's, I think, the challenge of it. And it sounds like you handled it well, but like there's know. always going to be a bit of improvisation. I don't mean that in like a comedic way. I just mean that you have to improvise the situation yeah. and figure out what the right thing to do is. You can always just do what Steve Martin does and just say, I remember my first beer. Can I mean, can you imagine, though, being the kind of person who goes to something like this and then thinks it's your place to yell at the person on stage. I mean, it's just the, the level of entitlement or the level of, of, of sort of self-importance of that move is, is just, again, it's one thing if you're going to see, uh, you know, somebody is, is hosting, somebody is, 
in conversation with Alex Jones. <laughs> and he's saying Sandy Hook was a false flag. It's one oh, thing. Do you mean Aaron a, Rodgers? I mean, vice presidential candidate Aaron Rodgers. But did like, you see, do you see that story? I mean, not to get us no, derailed, but apparently, no. I mean, I didn't I haven't read the whole thing Genevieve did, but I did see a headline that said in private conversations, Aaron Rodgers has some questions about that as well, apparently. Oh, I'm nothing would shock me about that. That shocks me. That galoot is, at this point. That is no, no, I, so I, scary and callous. I think he is. I mean, the irony is that, of course, they people think that there's a kind of woke mind virus. I really think that the conspiracy mind virus is so is so insidious and it metastasizes so quickly that and again you were honestly I give you credit you were hating Aaron Rodgers way before everyone else <laughs> just just me and all the Vikings fans <laughs> just based on his facial expression after he got tackled you didn't like the guy that and some smug shit he said about uh, Russell Wilson and uh, Russell Wilson's faith after and I'm not a man of faith but I just remember being like really you're gonna be that smug about Russell Wilson I that that I, I remember that being the thing that first I was just like f this guy I mean, you are you boy, you bought low on that. And I think I was like, I don't know. He seems like he seems like an OK science based guy to me. <laughs> boy, boy, uh, did we ever not know? I mean, I would think about this, though. How great would it be if RFK does pick him as his running mate and they actually manage to steal a significant number of votes from Trump? Because mm. I could be wrong about this. Somebody will probably correct me. Just yell it from the back if you disagree <laughs> with me on this. <laughs> right. I could be wrong, but I think right now the sense is that RFK entering the race is probably worse for Trump than it is for Biden. That makes sense logically, but then the the, my logic is yeah, and stuff, yeah. You know? But my logic I mean, is I do off think historically third-party candidates, at least the last few times, have been not good for mm -hmm. the Democrat. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think I don't know. This, this no label shit is its own whole thing, and it's like. I, that, I don't even want to get started on that. Like, if Joe Lieberman manages to lose the election for Biden because of just no labels thing, I mean, I'll be, I'll be pretty upset. But as far as the RFK thing, I mean, the idea that, like, if there was a way in which Aaron Rodgers, because of his hubris and idiocy, if he manages to somehow tilt the election away from Trump— God, that would be great. I mean, wouldn't that just be... I mean, talk about God using an imperfect instrument for his will. <laughs> well, they were you mentioning know? this on whatever I was listening to, whatever, you know, back episode of Lebitard I was catching up with just yesterday night. They were also talking about... Also, he's an active NFL player right now, which then led to the, like, what is more likely, that he becomes the vice president or that the Jets go deep into the playoffs oh, with what him? what a great... <laughs> What a great, great <laughs> prop bet in Vegas. Right. Here I go once again with the email. Every week, I hope that it's from a female. Oh, man. It's not from a female. All right, email or email before we get out of here? Yes, I would like to play for you a um, voicemail from... Oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to play this one. This is, uh, you know, I, my apologies. I'm a little bit behind on checking some of the voicemails. And this one comes from back in February uh, when you were talking about going to the American Film Institute, Luke, and, and uh -huh. feeling like you wanted to just sort of upend your yes, entire life. start over. And that was and, before I got heckled during Livewire. And, <laughs> that's right. Well, Amanda heard that one to talk about it well, a hi, bit. Well, hi, Luke and Andrew. This is Amanda calling from Skagit County. Um, I just was calling because I, so often I'm listening to the podcast and there's actually something happening in my real life that's so related, whether it be a mini year renovation or I don't know, just something that's said. Um, anyhow, I just, um, a topic of AFI, a very, very good friend of mine, uh, just got accepted to AFI last year. She is nice. 43 years old. Um, she's a couple years younger than me. And she was just having the exact same thing that Luke was saying about just always wanting to go to film school. And so she applied two years ago, got accepted, and just couldn't bite the bullet because it's about $100,000 to go to AFI. Oh, um, that's news to And me. then she applied again the next year with regret and actually made it in. So she knew she had to go and move down there last summer. So she's down there um, in her mid-40s getting her... Uh, degree focusing in screenwriting and possibly doing some directing so you know it, stranger things can happen 
Anyhow, I just thought that that was funny because you were talking about it today and maybe you even saw her there. Um, I probably did. Hope you guys are having a good one. Power out. It just occurred to me now I probably shouldn't have played that for you if I want the future of TBTL to remain strong. Are you going to leave us for the AFI? I, well, n- no, I'm going to continue doing the podcast, but I'm going to pivot. It's just going to be a film cast where okay. I break down specific cinematography decisions by Tarantino. Because um, I think that's what the world needs more of. <laughs> so me just going, he was using an airy flex. Mm-hmm. It was so interesting to me on um, The Hateful Eight that he decided to use that Panaflex for that m- kind of, I'm... Can you hear me running out of even pretend (laughs) photography terminology when it comes to uh, films? Yeah, yeah. I would, I would, um, you know, I I think I could maybe hang with that. Honestly, you'd be better, you'd be better at that podcast than I would be. I mean, you're like actually interested in and know a little bit about photography. Well, I'm, I'm, well, not, to be honest with you, I'm just worried about your gambling sub stack. Like, are you able to, like, kind of do both of those? The Burbank podcast, Stone Cold Locks. The Burbank Stone Cold Locks, the, the, the sub stack on that, the podcast about film, and uh-huh. all the while being a full time student at AFI. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, let's just uh, take it one step at a time. I am encouraged to know, though, that the, there is at least the possibility of me becoming the world's oldest AFI student. Yeah. Like that, that there's a path for that. Um, yeah. Because I think at 47 and I'm going to be 48 soon. So I think at 48, I might get some kind of a record. Um, but, uh, but thank you for the, thank you for the call. And thank you for this. Yeah. You know what it is? It's a good call. It's, it's the knowledge that potentially I could do something like that. Mm. That's all I need. I'm not going to do it, but I like to know that there's, other people in roughly my age cohort who are doing it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I was never going to go to AFI when I was 23, but it was a thing that was out there as a possibility. Mm-hmm. And it's the feeling that it's not a possibility anymore. That was causing me to be a little wistful. So all yeah. I needed was that voicemail to just kind of say, mm-hmm. yeah, you could do that. And then I'm going to not do it, but I know that I could do it. You and could that's do enough. It. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. you know, and as we it's like you, you and I mentioned years ago that we were past the, age of the oldest professional sports player like now by yeah. a lot <laughs> there was something always well, about like well there's always some 42 year old punter or something that you can say well i still have a shot there are no 47 year olds left i think probably no in the, i don't think anywhere so. in the nfl right there's Golf, some price guess. darts darts sure probably, yeah i mean you could do that for for I, although i'm sure eyesight is part of it i'm sure that there's yeah, like my eyes you know good kind of like um, muscle kind of memory and also Mm -hmm. tendons. And I'm sure, you know, I was going to try to use darts as an example of something where it's like age isn't relevant, but I bet you even in darts it is, right? It probably is now that you say that. I mean, you certainly see older dart players, so I don't know. I know that my eyes are pretty rotten. There are times where I get to the board and I'm not even sure exactly what I got. Um, I I also have pretty bad lighting in my little dart alley. But um, you know what I did the other day is I watched – I think it was a mistake. I don't know. Um, You know, I just started – you know – when we moved in here, I didn't realize how much I was going to be obsessed with playing darts. And again, I don't know anything None of us about it. Did, no, nobody saw that one coming. Um, but I knew that I liked playing darts. We had a we had a dartboard in um, in the basement when I was a kid. We had a dartboard that we kind of just inherited in in our barn in New Hampshire uh, when I'd go outside and smoke heaters and, and listen to like well probably TBTL and other mm-hmm. first generation podcasts. But anyway, point is I've always liked throwing darts, but like I you know don't know much about it, and then. When we got this one for our basement, you know, I said to Vives, oh, man, it'd be so fun to have a dartboard. She's like, well, let's do it. It's our place. So she made a nice backboard for it. And now I play darts literally almost every night that I'm home, at least like one round against against the dart bot. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I truly do enjoy it, but I've never taken it seriously. So what I'm getting at here is the other day I made the mistake of of watching a couple of YouTube videos about like proper stance, what you should properly be Uh doing, lining up your eye to the point and how to hold it exactly in the parallel. And some of it I'm doing naturally, but certainly the way I'm sort of like eyeing it is not right. But like once you have that knowledge, I'm like, well, maybe I'll just try practicing. But it's kind of like when they say like, 
if you drive for a long time, you just develop all these habits mm -hmm. that you're not even doing it really properly anymore. <laughs> Something like I sort of feel like it's that way with my darts. Like if I try to retroactively sort of change my stance and be more thoughtful about it and do it the way all of the YouTube pros tell me to, it's a very uncomfortable stance. It's not it takes away the fun for me. Uh -huh. And so then I just revert back to just slinging the dang things, you know, which ends right. up with better results in the short term. I'm sure if I was disciplined disciplined if i was a real disciplined daddy um i could is that from is that from arrested development why does that phrase live in my head maybe, I, maybe I, it's just the websites i go to i don't know I, um, maybe but if i was a real disciplined daddy and really like kind of got myself into a um a, into like trying to be a better dart stance and made it mm -hmm. like muscle memory for me i'm sure it'd be good in the long run but i don't i, I just don't have the willpower to do that because i just want to like i don't want to think about it that much when i'm listening to my podcast and throwing darts it's like Ty France completely reworking his swing during the offseason, yeah. Andrew. You've never mentioned that before. Is that something that you've been following? Well, unlike you, Ty France decided that it was worth the time investment to retool his swing and to come back, uh, maybe return to form of a couple seasons ago. And all mm -hmm. it, all reports are it's going well. So. It is going well, right? I, I mean, I don't. I haven't been following him um, closely. I know that uh, spring training started pretty hot for him. So yeah. I don't know, Luke. We're close. I did. I oh, I don't think I told you this. I so first of all, our fantasy baseball draft is tonight. I have done zero homework on it, so I'm I'm already like kind of uh, feeling anxious about that. But I thought for sure our fantasy baseball draft was tonight because I thought that the season begins this Thursday. I didn't realize until this weekend when I took a closer look that we are still a week and four days away from opening day, and that was a major bummer to me. I thought we were days uh, away from the crack of the bat in the world. Are, 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 aren't they uh, starting the season in Japan this year? They are not starting in Japan oh. this year. Uh, oh, oh, I really they, thought... Oh, wait. Oh, are they? I knew that they did one year, but I not didn't think Not the Mariners, they were... but just Major League Baseball. I oh, thought I had read maybe. something okay. about about the first, like, you know, the sort of kickoff game, if you will, being in Japan. But I, I could have been wrong about that. Oh, okay. M maybe. No, I, I, I don't know anything about that. I thought you meant the Mariners because they are. I'm they did to remember, do that I, back in the Ichiro era, right? Um, uh, it was Ichiro's last game. Remember, it was about five. Right. I, I'm trying to think, was it just pre-pandemic? I think it was the season before the pandemic, maybe. We woke up super early to watch that game, and then we recorded TBTL at, like, five in the morning or something, or six in the morning, I think. Oh, you know what? I think it's in... South Korea. Oh, interesting. The San the Diego teams? Padres and the Dodgers uh, oh, will be okay. playing the start of the MLB season in South Korea. It will be the first time that uh, an official MLB game has been played in South Korea. Oh, that is interesting. I wonder why they chose those teams. Well, I guess they're both uh, certainly West Coast teams, so that helps. Yeah. So, anyway, I'm getting excited right, for it too. I'm I've been, excited. I've been, I've been too busy to really kind of like deep dive on on these here mariners but uh i've got that on my on my schedule for probably i'm actually i'm relieved the season doesn't start until next week because that gives me a few more days mm -hmm. to develop all of my theories <laughs> and and right. and my pet peeves and yeah. my the to start basically like dragging um promotional photos of these players onto the desktop of my computer so that <laughs> when they fail me i can just tweet their face out so right. I'm pretty well, remember, about that. remember Stu Gotz's theory about hot takes like before a season or something. Luke, nobody remembers the wrong ones. Just have as many theories as possible. And then when the right ones come true, just uh, trumpet that as much as possible. Yes. Nobody's going to remember your wrong ones. So. Exactly. What do they say? Uh, success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. That's right. That's did you right. see? Or can yeah. you see what I just did? It's you got we know water out. we know spring is here because I just had to kill my first fly of the nice, season. Nice, nice, nice. I got to say, you know, Veeves and I were grilling last night, and like I just couldn't believe. Like I came home uh, from my volunteer gig, and I was kind of like really rushing. I'm like, we're gonna run out of time. It's gonna be dark, but it was sort of a spur of the moment. I, I went to the grocery store just to pick some stuff up, and I'm like, you know what? Let's just do this. Let's grill. Mm -hmm. I had just cleaned the grill anyway. I'm like, let's do it. Um, and Genevieve and I had the most wonderful night, and we were done. Done grilling and done eating. It was still light out. Ugh. It was warm. And Genevieve at one point turned to me and she said, it's not even spring yet. This is winter, technically. Spring isn't until next week either. Or no, later this week, right? Like, yeah. I was like, oh Officially. my God, you're right. This is amazing. We had such a, oh God, we were blessed with such good weather this weekend, man. It was awesome. Becca and I were belatedly celebrating her and her brother's birthday out at her other brother's house. The whole family had gotten together, their whole family. 
And it was a lovely afternoon. The weather was great. And then we were going back to like where her apartment is because I was going to get my car and and we were going to go our separate ways. And we just were sitting in the car just kind of chatting with the windows down. And it had just gotten dark, but it wasn't like dark, dark. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me so much of being in my 20s. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I feel like there's just a, 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 I don't know, a certain kind of energy and conversation that goes on in a dating relationship when you're younger that for some reason for me feels very associated with like kind of warm spring and summer nights. Mm -hmm. There's just, like I said, energetically something different. And I, we were just having a, just chat about life in the car and different things. And it wasn't overly fraught. It wasn't like we're having a, like mm -hmm. we need to talk about just, just talking. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and in the back of my mind, I was like, God, this feels, this feels like this reminds me of different, a different era of my life, which was a good thing. Cause I just said mm -hmm. the other day how, my my issue with being my age is not even that my life is actually bad because in a lot of ways my life is better than it's ever been. It's that my outlook is bad mm -hmm. because my when I was 22, my outlook was just so positive. I just was like, yeah, what are we doing? Great. Okay, that sounds fun. Or oh, that didn't work out, but we're doing something else. I was just like, I don't know. I just was upbeat. And then I've gotten older and I'm not as upbeat about things because I've just had more experience. And it's like, I want to reconnect with that. And somehow this one little thing of sitting in a car chatting with my girlfriend while it's still warm out mm -hmm. and it was, we're kind of in the gloaming, it felt like it felt connected to the time in my life when I was more upbeat. So I took mm -hmm. that as a positive. The changing of the seasons always makes me feel a little nostalgic in some way or another. And sometimes it pops up in sort of mm. um, in sort of surprising ways. I'm thinking yeah. of I, I kind of. Yeah. I'd probably talk about uh, smoking weed maybe a little bit too much on the show recently, but it does Can remind you? me of a time like was it last summer? No, I think it was two summers ago. Um, I, I'm going to leave everybody's na name out of this. Not that it's a big deal, but um, we were visiting um, our friends who has who have a, a, a lake house, a family yeah. lake house. And so a bunch of us descend there about once a summer. Uh, usually I'll spend one night. Other people will spend maybe a couple of nights or whatever. But it was just like a beautiful summer evening out at the lake. The only downside was I couldn't listen to the Mariners because there was really bad cell reception. So I couldn't play it on my phone. And I was also just getting bad. I'm trying to think maybe there wasn't a radio in the house. I think, which is strange for a lake house. I think I would pass a law that says every lake Reader's house Reader's Digest, have a radio. large <laughs> print, and a radio. <laughs> yes, yes, baby. And maybe some uh, and maybe some mystery novels, too. But anyway, uh -huh. so me and one of our friends who also uh, likes baseball a great deal, even plays baseball, uh, I said, let's just go out to my car and smoke a joint and like listen to the game <laughs> on the radio. And we were just sitting in, in my car with the windows rolled down, smoking a J, listening to the Mariners. And oh. um, it was like, I, I had not felt like a teenager in so long it was like honestly i think that was like two summers ago and it's still like that <laughs> one of the highlights of my summers yeah it was wonderful well we've got a few of those days in front of us so. here um for the next few months which is going to be great uh that's going to do it for today's episode of tbtl um tbtl up in smoke but the good news is we <laughs> no more references of weed from me going forward we ever. are um I listen. It grows in the ground, dude. <laughs> it's a lot better than the um, the ethyl glycol or whatever it is that I've been pouring into my system for years. Um, Wait, what but is any, that? That's like I think the technical name for booze. I think. Oh, like, oh, oh, I think, oh, okay. I think that's the like the the active ingredient or whatever in alcohol. I thought but. you were talking about like your your hair medication or something. No, dude, that's finasteride, <laughs> Andrew. Get it straight. Sorry. That's actually, I think. Yeah, I think fin is finasteride the generic version. Whatever it is, I'm using the off. I'm using the generic hair regrow, whatever pill. You ever go out to your car, roll down the windows, take some finasteride? <laughs> what is it? Finasteride. And finasteride. Listen <laughs> and listen to the Mariners game. Right after we're done here. <laughs> right after we're done here. Summer so. baby. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back here tomorrow with more imaginary radio for you. I'll be in Los Angeles. Um, so we'll see you from there. In the meantime, have a great Monday. Take care of yourselves. Go Mariners. And please remember, no mountain too tall. And good luck to all. This is Holly in Alexandria. Just a quick note. I went to clear my phone because I was starting a Zoom call with some stuffy, important people. And instead of clearing the... Pod catcher screen it.
turned it on. So in the background of my very stuffy Zoom call, the song about secret food and poop starts playing and the looks of befuddlement across Zoom was pretty amazing. So thank you for that. It made a stuffy meeting a little less so. Cheers. Power out.